So I just want to focus on uh, this last verse uh, in Philippians 1, where it says in verse 29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So you see here, God has plans for us not only to be saved, but to go through suffering. So my, the title of my sermon this morning is Why God Allows Suffering. Why God Allows Suffering. Now, suffering uh, is often the stumbling block for many unbelievers. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, where you go out soul winning with somebody who is uh, bitter at God or doesn't want anything to do with God might say something like, well, if God exists, then he wouldn't have allowed me to go through this or he wouldn't have let me go through that or he wouldn't have taken this from me or taken that from me. And people have this idea that a loving God doesn't allow suffering. But that's where the error starts. The error starts is that people have this false assumption that a loving God doesn't allow suffering. But where do they learn this from? You know, because I don't know what Bible people are reading where they think the God of the Bible doesn't allow suffering. I mean, did they never read about Jesus? You know, Jesus, the, our, our prime example, went through suffering, went through immense persecution and suffering for us. And he didn't have, you know, there were times where he said, you know, the Son of Man had not where to lay his head. Oftentimes he didn't have somewhere to sleep or something to eat and things like that. He went through all sorts of suffering. So we often should not be surprised that we go through suffering. But, you know, one danger that is out there is the prosperity gospel. Right? What is the prosperity gospel? Well, the prosperity gospel is a teaching that says if you're a Christian, you know, if you're following God, then you, you know, you're, everything's going to work out well for you. You know, if you, you know, you're going to be like, you know, Joel Osteen and you're going to have, you know, your best life now and you're going to have straight teeth and you're going to be rich and you're going to marry somebody beautiful and everything's just going to be great for you. That's, that's the prosperity gospel, this teaching that if you are a Christian and if you're an obedient Christian, then life's just going to be great for you. You're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Nothing could be further from the truth. But sometimes this, be, this sort of behavior, or this sort of thinking creeps into true believers' heads as well. Because do you ever find yourself saying something to yourself like, oh, like God, like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do what's right. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I'm going to church. But I don't know why life is so hard. Do you ever find yourself saying things like that? That's the prosperity gospel mentality creeping in. Because why? I mean, just because you're in church, just because you're reading your Bible, just because you're trying to do what's right, why does that mean that life should be easy? I mean, was it easy for Paul? I mean, Paul's writing the, you know, the Philippian letter in jail, in bonds, right? And I mean, he, of, of anybody that could say that he is following Jesus Christ and saying he's doing the right thing, I mean, should not his life be a little bit easier? But no, because it's a lie. The prosperity gospel is a lie that if you, you know, follow God, that y your life's just going to be great and it's going to be pleasant and there's going to be no suffering in it. No, God, it's given you. Look at this in Philippians 1. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And oftentimes that suffering comes in different forms, in different people's lives. And we're going to look at uh, some of that suffering in the Bible today. So we don't want that prosperity gospel creeping into our mindset. And what, what is that going to do? It's just going to set the wrong expectations. If you think that being a Christian is just a life in a bed of roses, you're just going to have the wrong expectation. And then as you grow older and you realize we live in a fallen world, we live in a sinful world, things don't always turn out the way you want them to turn out. Things don't always go right. You know, things happen in your life where you have suffering, you have health challenges, financial challenges, people are going to fail you, all sorts of things, right? Things are going to go wrong you're not going to get surprised. You're not going to get caught off guard and, and you're not going to do the foolish thing, which is to charge God and say, I can't believe, you know, and to somehow doubt God's goodness and his justice just because He has allowed you to go through some hard times. So suffering is hard. You know, I'm not downplaying any suffering. Suffering is tough. You know, if you're going through health 
problems or you're going through relationship problems or you're going through some persecution suffering is not easy it can be discouraging but the thing is it should never come as a surprise you know should you be shocked and go oh like my life is so hard i just i just i just never saw this coming well maybe you have to get into the word a bit more you know you have to look to your example a bit more and Jesus said, hey, if they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his own household? Right? So if Jesus said that to us and we're aware of this, you know, that's going to prepare us at least mentally for us to go through hard times because we're not shocked when they come. So there's a lot of suffering in the world. But one thing you want to keep in mind is not all forms of suffering in our life are caused by God. And I think we need to understand this, that not just because you're going through hard times, that doesn't always mean it was God's fault because there are different causes of suffering, right? There are actually four. I mean, first one is, it can be yourself, right? So everyone always wants to blame somebody else for the suffering they have in their life, but sometimes you need to reflect a bit and it could be that the suffering in your life is actually self-inflicted. Let's look at Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24 is the field of the slothful. I don't know if you ever read this in Proverbs 24. I always, I always love this proverb. I can just teach you so much and just it reminds me as well as something I always struggle with, which is laziness. It says, I went by the field of the slothful. So this is Solomon talking here. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. So he goes past the field of the lazy, and he sees hey, all the weeds had grown over, fences broken down, stone walls crumbling. He says, then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. What is he saying? I looked at this field of the lazy person, and I learned something. He says, yet a little sleep a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. So what is he saying here? He's saying here, he's looking at the field of the slothful, and this, this field that is overgrown with weeds, right? It's got all these problems, right? All the stone walls, it's all falling apart. He realizes, hey, I learned this, that, hey, this field didn't become like this overnight. He's looking at the field and he's realizing, hey, little by little, this lazy person is basically reaping what he's sown little by little, being lazy, sleeping in, a little folding of the hands to sleep, a little slumber. It's just always putting things off. So just like, you know, if you're not where you want to be in life, it could just be self-inflicted. It's, it's not God holding you back. You know, maybe you're just being lazy in terms of lazy and to get out there and do what other people are doing to get ahead in life or to, to make a, a successful living or, you know, if you, if you, if you want something career-wise. But it's not only that where you, you know, reap what you sow. It's, it's also when it comes to health reasons as well. You know, people make fun of people that are like, oh, you know, these people are all into organic and they're always detoxing. And you know, they make fun of them. Oh, you, you're going to exercise again and all this sort of stuff. And then they're the ones later on in life, you know, starting to put on weight, starting to, you know, get, you know, unhealthy, right? Having, having health problems, health problems here and health problems there. And oftentimes, you know, people, they get to that stage of life and then they start saying to themselves, oh, you know, uh, you know, Satan's doing this to me or God's doing this, God's making me go through hard times. But then if you were to look or if they were to reflect on their own life and how they took care of themselves, they didn't care about what they eat. They're just eating McDonald's all the time. They're drinking soft drink all the time. They think, oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, drink, this, I didn't drink the Coke, I drank the Diet Coke. So I don't know why I've got the diabetes and all these things. Well, you know, newsflash, guys, Diet, Diet Coke is even worse for you. Than, you, you best just drink regular Coke rather than drink Diet Coke. But all that sugar is not good for you. So it's just this idea that, you know, you need to think that suffering sometimes is just caused by yourself. You know, if people are lazy. You know, they can, they can obviously put on weight. If they're not eating right, they can have health problems. So when you, when you come across these health problems in your life, they could be self-inflicted. It's the same with 
It's the same with relationship problems. You know, people are like, oh, you know, my, my marriage is doing terrible. Like, oh, you know, like, I don't know, I don't know where it came from, right? Where my, you know, marriage just, just hit me like a ton of bricks that my, my husband committed adultery or my wife committed adultery. And then you think, well, you know, it's the day by day, nagging each other, denying each other, you know, that, 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 that intimacy and that poor relationship, sometimes that's what it leads to. So just like looking, you know, when I look at the, the, like Solomon looks at the field of the slothful and realizes, hey, this work didn't just crumble overnight. It's the same with hell. It's the same with relationships. When you see a couple get divorced, that doesn't just happen overnight. You know, this is a build-up of a poor relationship over, over many, many years. You know, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep when it comes to even relationships. So that is one cause of suffering. One cause of suffering is our own. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So if you sow bad things to your life, it's going to, you're going to reap those bad things as well. Now, what's another cause of suffering? Another cause of suffering is, is others. You know, this is, this is often a conversation I have out soul winning where people will say things like, oh, you know, well, if there's a loving God, why is there so much suffering in the world? There is oppression and starvation and, you know, people in third world countries have it so much worse than us. And, and oftentimes, the reason why they got it so bad, it's not because God is doing it to them, it's because there are evil people in the world oppressing other people. That's often the cause of starvation is oppressive governments. You know, why, why in another country can a person not make a living like us and just go out, work a job, you know, earn a living generally in those third world countries because the government is so oppressive and regulated and all sorts of things that they're just not able to do that. You know, it's just, it's too oppressive. So oftentimes it is governments, it is other people, or there's drug cartels and things going on that are in cahoots with the government, stopping people from being able to make a life for themselves, being productive. Look at what it says here in James 4. It says here, <coughs> From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot but obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So we see here that this is often the reason for a lot of wars that happen in the world. It's lust. It's this government wanting to fight with one another for resources and whatnot. Uh, I don't know if it's the government's driving it or if the banks that are funding the government driving it, but this often is a, the reason for a lot of the suffering that happens in the world. If you think about it, you know, why, why are people oppressed and whatnot? It's because a lot of the elites uh, are in cahoots with the government. You know, when I say cahoots, I mean working together with the government, oppressing people and making people's lives difficult, causing a lot of that suffering. And oftentimes, you know, part of the reason why I like to preach this sermon is not only to remind people and to help them, uh, you know, get their perspective back when they're going through hard times, but it's also to help you answer the question. Right? Because so many people reject Jesus or reject God because of this question. And yet it's a question that is so simple to answer. And it's just, it's just crazy that people that grow up with a, Catholic, uh, with, a, with a Christian background get away from the faith because of this. I almost just think, like, like I said at the beginning, I don't know what book they've been learning every Sunday you know, in church where they got this idea that a loving God doesn't allow any suffering. I mean, did they not learn about any of the apostles, about any of the, any of the, any of the prophets? Did they not learn about Jesus? It's just, it's just insane that people get this idea that, that if they are a Christian, they are completely absolved from any hardship in their life. No, no, God's will is that we go through hardship. Um, so some of this suffering... I guess it's not always caused by God, it's self-inflicted. This is where it's caused by other people. So we think of wars, starvation, you know, lack of food, you know, bad water supplies sometimes is government corruption. You've got health problems too, where you know, you've got mass medications and vaccinations sometimes happening in some, um, some uh, uh, societies and that causing a lot of problems as well. 
Look what it says here in 1 Timothy 6. And this sort of ties in with James 4, where that lust is leading to wars and fightings. But it says here in 1 Timothy 6, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And this is so true that a lot of the harm that is done to other people, which is what evil is, is the, caused by a love of money. Now, you need to understand this passage correctly. This passage is not saying that the love of money is the cause of all sin. That's how most people understand this passage. They think, oh, you know, how is love of money the cause of all sin? How is every sin that is ever committed started by the love of money? I don't think that's what this verse is teaching. Um, first of all, evil, not all evil is sin, right? Because God does evil. Evil is when you harm somebody else. So this is when humans harm other humans because God can justly harm humans. Um, if he's bringing down judgment on them. But what it's saying here, it's not even saying that the love of money is the cause of all evil, right? Because you might think, well, how does the love of money cause all evil? No, it's saying that the love of money is the root of all evil. You think the root of a plant, the root of a plant is not the start of the plant. That's like the seed. The root is what takes, takes root, if you think about it. It goes into the ground, it gives the plant strength, it's what gives the plant sustenance. So that's what I think of. I think of when the love of money is the root of all evil, it's like the love of money is what's fueling and keeping all the evil in the world alive and well and you know, continuing to grow and have its ugly fruit. And remember that it's not money is not the root of all evil. So money is not evil in and of itself. It's the desire for money that is the root of all evil. Because money is a tool. Money can be used for good and it can be used for evil. But if somebody just covets after money, just desires money in and of itself, that is a very dangerous situation to be in because that is what is the root of all evil. And oftentimes people that, you know, just will after money and just are covetous after money end up hurting people in order to reach that goal. So, Suffering can be caused by others. Number three, suffering can be caused by Satan and his demons. I didn't, even, I didn't know if you know that, but we learn a lot from the story of Job. Such an interesting story that we, real, that we learn a lot about the supernatural powers that Satan has. And some of these, when you read, you may not have thought about this before, often, often uh, more often than not, people attribute all these to only God. But look at this. It says here, And the Lord said unto Satan, this is Job 1, so we just skipped a bit into the story. So this is when he says, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So this is when God gives Satan the authority to go and test Job, but he can't touch his body. He can take anything else away. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were ploughing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So isn't it interesting here that Satan is even able to cause a foreign invading force to come and pillage and kill family, right? So this is, this is caused by Satan. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, look at this, the fire of God is fallen from heaven. Now who caused the fire to fall from heaven? Was it God? No, it was Satan. But look at the servant, not knowing that Satan is the one behind this, automatically assumes that it's from God, right? The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and it burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans, so this is another foreign invading force, made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, the, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another. So man, if you're ever going through some hard times, it's good to read through Job. It's a good reminder that you know, sometimes the things we go through are not as difficult as we think they are compared to Job. But also we see the end of Job, right? Where Job realized he didn't know everything and he had to trust God. 
While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And look at this. Behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young men and they are dead and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. What does this remind you of when you see a great wind from the wilderness? Doesn't that remind you of like a tornado or a whirlwind or something? What do most people call these natural disasters? Don't they say things like, oh, that was an act of God? You know, in most, in most insurance policies, you'll say, oh, that was an, an act of God that came through. But is, is God the only one that has the power to cause natural disasters? No, Satan has the power as well. Right? So Satan is able to cause these things. So when people blame God and say, oh, why did God cause that tsunami that killed hundreds of thousands of people? Was it God? Or did Satan just know that everyone was going to blame God, so he made it happen just to make people, more people, turn away from God? Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head, fell upon the ground and worshipped said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Um, and we, we, we won't go on to the second one for sake of time, but in chapter 2, it goes on to how he was given boils. So now it's actually actual health challenges, right, from Satan, where he actually had boils from the crown of his head to the bottom of his feet. And, uh, oh, man, I really feel for Job because, you know, I, I, I personally do have, sometimes I get flare-ups of eczema. Not as bad as my son Abel, but there was a time when I had it all over my body and, you know, literally where you just got weeping sores in your body and it's just, oh, it's just festing underneath your clothes and everything. And I just can't imagine, you know, those were probably pretty minor <laughs> compared to Job and that was like living in hell, I'm sure. So I, I don't envy Job at all. Uh, having huge boils that just probably don't stop um, pussing. Um, and he's just got to sit there just scraping himself. That's probably why he's just sitting there naked scraping himself because you can't really wear clothes when you have boils, when you have eczema. It's really difficult um, because just, uh, just all the, the, the oozing of the pus and everything that comes out. <clears throat> you know what's something that's really interesting about Job's story, if you didn't realize, is, you know, at the end of it all, um, if you know the story of Job, you know, he gets tested and then his friends come and they're trying to figure out why it's all happening. And at the end, God reveals himself and basically doesn't even answer Job's questions. Just ask Job a bunch of questions like, where were you when I made the earth? Do you know this? Do you know that? And Job basically just says, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know everything that God knows. I'm just going to have to trust God. But you know what? What's interesting about Job's story is that he had no idea, even at the end of Job, that all this happened between God and Satan. Right? So, he, so we read the story and realize, oh, Job, you know, Job, that was, that was Satan that did all that to you. It wasn't God. But do you know, like, Job, Job didn't know that. Job, at the end of it, just all these things happened to him. He didn't know why it was, whether it was him that caused it, God was causing it. He just knew that God allowed him to go through it. He didn't know that God had actually allowed Satan to go and do all these things to him. But at the end of it, he just realized he just had to trust God. He didn't, he didn't, because it didn't matter at the end of the day, because God knew what was best for him. And that was the lesson of Job. And, um, and obviously at the end of Job, he was blessed even more greatly for how he handled the whole situation. So he's a great example for anyone going through hard times. So Satan definitely is a, is a cause for suffering. Uh, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And the last one, obviously, because God can cause suffering. And, you know, this is where we ought to have some fear of God. You know, I would rather just, you know, be, try and be the most obedient child I can in the family of God, rather than come down, you know, be living under the chastisement of God my whole life. Because God, you know, even if you may not itself inflict harm or somebody may not inflict harm on you or Satan may not be after you personally, hey, God is a loving Heavenly Father and He wants to make sure His children are living right. And just, because, and just like you have children and if they don't live right, you want to get them in line, hey, God sometimes needs to get you in line. 
And this is why sometimes you need to go through some hard times. You need to go through some suffering because you know what? Sometimes when things are going a little bit rosy for you, you get a li little bit fleshly. That's how it is, right? When things are going well, when, things are, when there's not, nothing tough going on in your life, it's, it's so much easier to walk in the flesh. And sometimes God needs to bring out that spiritual rod, bring a bit of suffering in, into your life to bring you back on track. And sometimes that can be as, as extreme as in Acts 5. In Acts 5, we see the story of Ananias and Sapphira. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. Right? So they secretly, they're saying, hey, they're selling their land for this much, but they're saying, you know, they maybe they sold it for 200000 for example, but they're saying, oh, but we only sold it for 150000 right? Because they want everyone to think that they gave the whole price and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, what is, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So what is he saying here? Hey, if you only wanted to give, you know, 150,000 of the 200,000, you could, you could have kept the 50,000. But that, that wasn't the problem. The, what, the, the problem wasn't that Ananias and Sapphira didn't want to give the whole amount. The problem is they wanted everyone to think that they'd given the whole amount when they didn't. And then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down, look at this, and gave up the ghosts. Why haven't he died? And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after. So I guess that's how long it takes, right, to bind somebody up and bury them. When his wife, not knowing what was done, came in, and Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead. And carrying her forth, buried her by her husband, and great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. See, I don't know about you, but I would rather be the one learning from Ananias and Sapphira's example than being Ananias and Sapphira, right? So you can be Ananias and Sapphira. It's like I tell my kids. It's like you can either learn the hard way or you can learn the easy way, right? You either learn the easy way by learning from somebody else's example or you've got to learn the hard way and you mess up and now you're going to have to pay for it. So we need to keep that in mind that God can cause suffering in our life. There ought to be some fear in our life of just willfully sinning against God, right? Just willfully doing what's wrong because God's going to resist the proud, right? He gives grace to the humble. If we just pridefully sin against God, you don't think God's going to be like that? Well, you want to learn the easy way or do you want to learn the hard way? I would rather learn from the example of others than have God's chastisement on my life teaching me and adding or the, to the already burdensome suffering we have in our life to get my attention. Hebrews 12, Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So you see, there is different causes of suffering. You can self-inflict suffering. Other people can cause suffering. You know, there's obviously satanic influence as well. But also God causes suffering as well. So you don't want to necessarily blame God for all the suffering that is going on because it's not always God that is causing it, even though he ultimately allows it. So I guess the question is, people will ask, well, why doesn't God do something about it? Right, if there's all this, if this isn't, you know, if, if, this, if there's all this suffering in the world and there's all this pain and, you know, all this discomfort and, you know, all this persecution, why doesn't God do something about it? And the answer to this question is that God has done something about it. It's just that God 
hasn't done what most people want him to do about it. Right? But you need to understand how God works. Right? God doesn't necessarily rehabilitate something. He just replaces it when he's trying to fix it. So when God fixes something, God doesn't necessarily rehabilitate it. What does that mean? Take that existing thing and fix it up. God often just replaces it with something new. And that's what he's going to do with the world. Look at what it says here in Matthew 9. It says, No man put a piece of a new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. So you see here, you don't take a new piece of clothing to fix an old piece of clothing, right? Otherwise, the, the, the old piece of clothing is saying that whatever you're fixing just ends up looking worse. And now you've ruined a perfectly good garment, right? You just replace the old garment with a perfectly new garment. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. Now let's look at Revelation 21 because this is where we see the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. It says, so you can see here, this is God's MO, right? This is the way he operates, is that he's not trying to fix this world. So when people say, why isn't God doing anything about this fallen world, all the pain and suffering that we, that we experience in this world, well, he has done something about it. He's just not doing what you want him to do about it. Revelation 21 is when we read about what is finally done about it. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Look at this. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. So you see there, you see how he's not reforming the old earth. He's not saying I saw the first heaven and first earth fixed. No, no, it's a completely new heaven and new earth. And what happened to the old heaven and the old earth? The first heaven and the first heaven, uh, first earth, they just pass away. They just disappear. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So you see here, God has done something, and it's, about to, it's going to be fulfilled in the future. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, look at this, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Amen. And he said unto me, It is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So who is he that overcometh the world? Right? It's those of us that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why it's so funny when people say things like, well, there's all this suffering. This world is imperfect. What is God doing about, doing about it? Well, 2,000 years ago, God stepped into the creation. And he stepped into the creation so that he could take on your sins and my sins, die for you to give you the opportunity to be on this perfect heaven and earth. See, so he's not trying to fix this heaven and earth. So if you're waiting for God to fix this heaven and earth, you're going to be waiting for a long time because it's never going to happen. But what God did is he provided a way for you to be on the new heaven and new earth when he fixes it. So he has done something about it. You need to make sure that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that when the old heaven and old earth passes away, you are left there on the new heaven and new earth rather than being cast into the lake of fire. Because look at verse 8. But, see, so that he that overcometh, if you believe on Jesus Christ, that's how you overcome. You will be on the new heaven and the new earth. But, verse 8, the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. 
So that's hell. You need to make sure you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure you're going to that new heaven and new earth. Look at the connection here in Hebrews 1. I always find this connection interesting with Matthew 9. It says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. So notice here, it's the creation of heaven and earth. But look at what it's likened to. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Right? Because one day they're going to go away. They all shall wax old as doth a garment. So notice here how he is likening heaven and earth, the creation of heaven and earth, with a piece of clothing. Right? They all shall wax old as doth a garment. Look at this. And as a vesture, right? That's another piece of clothing. Shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. <coughs> but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So God has done something about it. So when people say, why doesn't God do something about it? He has done something about it. He stepped into the creation as Jesus Christ, went to the cross, but born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, was buried. His soul went into hell for three days and three nights, suffered an eternity of hell for us, rose again from the dead. Right? 40 days later, ascended back up to heaven. One day he's going to come again. How can anybody say that God has done nothing about the pain and suffering in this world? When the Bible says God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Absolute proof that God did something about the pain and suffering in our life. And all we have to do is believe on him. So why does God allow us to suffer? And the, the answer is, is very simple. Why does God allow us to suffer? It's because suffering makes us better people. I mean, hopefully you've realized, hopefully you've come to a point in your life already where you realize when you go through hard times, it makes you a better person. And God knows that. That's why he allows you to go through hard times. But then, you know, there are other reasons why he allows you to go through hard times. Sometimes it gets you... You know, when you go through hard times, it gets you to rejig your values and to reshift focus in your life. Look what it says here in Ecclesiastes 7. A good name is better than precious ointment and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now, why is the day of death better than the day of birth? You'd think, well, isn't birth a rejoicing occasion? But the Bible's saying here, no, no, no. The day of death is actually more valuable to you than your, than your birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. What is he saying here? What is the house of mourning? That's like a funeral that you're going to. What is the house of feasting? This is like a party. And the Bible saying here, you know, it's better for you and your character as a person to go somewhere where you reflect on death, to go to a funeral and realize life is short, you reflect on death. Why? Because that is the end of all men. Because one day that person's going to be you. One day you're going to die. One day your life is going to be over. And when you go to the house of mourning, you reflect on that. And you think, man, what am I using my life for? What is my life? What are people going to say about me when I go? That is the end of all men. Look, and the living will lay it to his heart. So sometimes suffering in your life happens, or maybe you'll lose a loved one, unfortunately, and it makes you reflect on things. And God allows you to go through this to help you to grow as well. Right? And, and obviously God, you know, it's not, he's not just tunnel vision, right? It's not like everything just revolves around you. So he somehow can work everyone's life, you know, so that he's teaching everyone simultaneously, even though, you know, um, you know, that's something for God to know and for us to one day ask him about. <clears throat> Sorrow is better than laughter, for by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the house of fools is in the house, the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. So one is, you know, suffering allows us to change our values, to rethink what is important in life. And oftentimes when you go to a funeral, doesn't that, don't you do that? You know, when you go to a funeral, often you start to think, oh man, that thing I've been worried about, it's not that big a deal when life is so short. Or that, you know, that thing I've been chasing for, man, should, should I really be 
investing so much of my life doing that? You know, oh man, I, I spend so much time thinking, thinking about what other people think about me. And one day I'm just going to be dead. What does it even matter? Why don't I just work on what God thinks about me? That's what's going to last eternity. These are the thought of, sort of things you think about when you go through hard times. You know, I've heard the saying that sometimes God has to, you know, bring you down to rock bottom before you'll get on your knees and look up. So, not only that, but suffering like Job, it grows our character, doesn't it? But he knoweth the way that I take when he had tried me. I shall come forth as gold. It gives us stronger character. Sometimes when we go through hard times, it gives us a bit of resilience in our character. We're not so easily shot down. We're not so easily offended. We get some experience in us so that when we go through life, we can face even greater challenges. What's another reason? We read this in Philippians 1 when we read through Philippians 1. It, it causes us to look to eternity. Because sometimes, you know, people say, you know, why does God allow, people ask, why does God allow suffering? Well, if God made your life so easy, you'd never think about eternity. You know, if, if, if life is hard here, that makes you look forward to something else, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? So it's the same. God doesn't want you to just be emotionally invested in the here and now because he wants you to desire the heavenly. And this is what Paul said. He said, From, to me, to live is Christ. Look at this. And to die is gain. He actually looked forward to dying. It's almost, you know, I don't know the, the word is, uh, you know, like most people that don't believe in eternity, they think people that think like this are like sick in the head, right? That, that they want to commit suicide and go on. But this is why for a, for, a, for a believer, oftentimes the temptation of committing suicide is even greater. Right? Because they know where they're going to go when they die. So when people say, you know, believers never commit suicide, I can imagine believers that go through hard times, there is an even greater temptation to commit suicide because you know where you're going as opposed to somebody who doesn't know where they're going. But look at what it says here. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet, while I sh what, yet what I shall choose, I what not. For I am, I am in a straight betwixt two. What does this mean? He's saying he's got two options and he can't decide which one's better, right? I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. So you see, the fact that Paul went through hard times here made him look forward to what the future held. You know, but obviously we don't want to take that into our own hands and take our own life. That is a grave sin. Um, so God, God obviously keeping you alive, having you here, he has a purpose for you. And like Paul, he realized that even though he wanted to depart and be with Christ, he's not going to take that into his own hand because he knew God had him on this earth for a reason. And he said here in verse 24, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And you are abiding in the flesh here because it's needful for somebody if you are doing what God wants you to do. And there is a multitude of other reasons. I, I will just read them off quickly on my list here. But, you know, maybe you have an undesired outcome and that teaches you patience. You know, if you're trying to work for something and it's not going according to plan, it teaches you some patience to keep going. Uh, maybe somebody has broken a promise to you. And what can that teach you? That can teach you to only rely on God. That you don't put your faith on other people and put your joy in other people because people can let you down. Um, you know, maybe it's a mistake. You know, you do, you do a mistake and it teaches you to do something correctly. Um, or maybe you have an uncontrollable situation, something that's so out of your hands. And what does that teach you? It teaches you to pray, doesn't it? Because oftentimes we forget to pray. We forget to include God in our day and ask Him for help. But you know what? When you come across a situation where you have absolutely no control, what's the first thing you do? God, it's all, it's all for you now. You know, you commit things to him. It forces you to learn to pray again when things go out of your control. Sometimes when you lose something, it teaches you about priorities. Or when you go through a hard time, sometimes it teaches you to be able to comfort others as well. You know, because when you go through hard times, you can now relate to somebody else. You know, ultimately, the reason why God wants us to go through hard times is because he wants us to be more like Jesus Christ. Romans 8, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed 
to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You see, God's plan for you is not just to have this comfortable life. You know, God's plan for you is not to just have everything, you know, all your ducks in a row and to be able to save for that house and to be able to get a dog and a nice car and just have a, have a nice breezy life where you can just retire and travel around and see the world. See, God, God doesn't have that life for you. God doesn't want that life for the believer. And oftentimes when believers go for that, he may bring some suffering and some challenges into your life to get it a little bit off course because he doesn't want just a nice, comfortable life for you. He wants you to be more like Jesus. And you know what Jesus' life was like? It was difficult. It was suffering. There was work. Look at what it says here in Hebrews 2. And we'll end here. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory, look at this, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, if Jesus Christ as a man had to go through sufferings in order to become perfect, how much more us who have sin need to go through sufferings to be more like Jesus Christ? So that is God's plan for you. So when you go through suffering, don't charge God foolishly, thinking, you know, why is God letting me go through? You ought not be surprised by suffering in your life. You ought to try and embrace it and think, what am I learning from this? What is God trying to teach me from this? Because God's will for you is to become like Jesus Christ. So that's God's will for us. There's multiple reasons why suffering happens in our life. And the reason why God allows it is because ultimately he wants you to be more like Jesus and you need to go through suffering to become more like Jesus. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his perfect example, something we can only dream to achieve, Lord, but something we ought to strive to achieve every day. Uh, Lord, it's not easy uh, going through life. Our life is... A lot easier than many in the past have had it, Lord. So help us to always keep that in perspective. But Lord, we just pray that as we struggle through life, that you give us grace, give us the right perspective, Lord. And uh, I pray, Lord, that we would always be open to receiving your correction, that we would be more like Jesus every day. He had to be perfected through sufferings. And Lord, even more so, do we need to be perfected through sufferings. So help us never to be bitter. Help us to understand why there is suffering in the world and help us to understand why you as a loving God allow these things into our lives. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.